How you doing? Welcome. Come on in. Good morning. Welcome. How are you today? Good to see you.
God, you are worthy of praise and worthy of honor, worthy of glory. We bless your holy name this morning. We praise you and bless you this morning. You alone are God. You alone are worthy. You alone have triumphed by your blood. You alone are worthy to take the scroll and open the seals. We thank you that you've redeemed us out of every tribe, kindred, nation, and tongue to be a priest unto our God, that you have washed us in the blood of your Lamb, and you have made us white, and you have sanctified us and called us out of the darkness into the light of Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh, we give you praise. We give you praise. We give you thanksgiving today. Worthy are you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's sing that chorus one more time, guys. Hallelujah. Holy, holy. also thank you for your ongoing faithfulness in giving. You can actually give in three different ways. Simply go to the description portion of this video on YouTube and click on the giving link. This will take you to our website. From there you can give securely through PayPal. There is no account required. Or you can also download the Givelify app. Find Living Faith Church, Exelon, Wisconsin, or simply mail a check or money order to Living Faith Church, P.O. Box 65, Exelon, Wisconsin, 54835. Please remember to pray for our nation and our leaders, along with our LFC missions families in Tanzania, Africa, India, Mexico, and Honduras. Thanks, everyone. And first, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says, Yes, Paul speaking here, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Everybody say it with me. I am going to suffer persecution. Amen. You know, the one thing you have to realize, we're faith people. You can't faith persecution away, and nor should you, because we are allotted to suffer for the cause of Jesus Christ. Amen? The story of God's people from the foundation of the planet, from the day sin came into the world, is a story of persecution. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when, tr when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, when sin was allowed to come into the planet and pollute the planet, because of the transgression of Adam and Eve, and of course that sin was passed upon all people and that all have sinned, there was a precedent set between the children of God and the children of darkness, between Adam and the seed of man and the seed of evil. 
And this is what it says in Genesis 3.15. From now on, you and the woman will be enemies, and your offspring and her offspring will be enemies. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. So we have an enemy. We have an enemy that hates us with a passion. Satan wants to destroy your life, and he will use any means possible to do so because he hates God. And, of course, he cannot afflict God the only way he can it all get to God is by attacking what God holds dear to him, and that's the people of God. Amen? So we are going to suffer persecution. Jesus himself said in verse 18 of John chapter 15, When the world hates you, remember it hated me before it hated you. The world would love you if you belong to it, but you don't. Now, when he says the word world here, he's not talking about the planet. He's talking about the system of the world, the order of the world. So he said, the world hates you. If you belong to the world, remember he said, you're in the world, but you're not of the world. If you belong to the world, the world would love you, but it, you don't. I chose you to come out of the world, and so it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? A servant is not greater than his master. Since the, they persecuted me naturally, they will persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. The people of the world will hate you because you belong to me, for they don't know God who sent me. In verse 25, this has fulfilled what the scripture said, they hated me without a cause. This world, this, the people of this world, many of the people of this world that are bound by, this, by the darkness of this world, they hate Jesus Christ. They don't know why they hate Jesus Christ. They hate Jesus Christ because their deeds are evil. They hate Jesus Christ because they are under the sway of the prince of the power of the air, the spirit of now works in the sons of disobedience. Now, Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. Now, I'm not saying that every single person on the planet who's not a believer overtly hates Jesus Christ. But Jesus himself said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Jesus himself said, by this we know those who are of God those who love me obey my voice, will keep my commandments. So Jesus himself said the world's going to hate you. And I believe persecution can be summed up based upon Hebrews chapter 11, speaking of the believers of the Old Testament. And in verse 32 it says, And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, also of David and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of the fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings, yes, and chains and of imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins, goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. So if you look at that scripture, what does that tell you? It tells you, as I said before, much of the scriptures are written from a position of people who are under great dress and, and suffering to a people that are under great duress and suffering. So the history and the story of faith is a story of perseverance, a story of, pers of persecution, and a story of God bringing his people through persecution and trouble. It is a story of God delivering his people out of darkness and out of great trouble. So we have to remember there's two, two aspects of God's working with his people. There are times where God supernaturally has delivered his people. And we're going to look at several of those stories today. Where God, in, in the face of adverse circumstances, great, certain death, God has delivered his people. But there are many times where God has not delivered his people. Where people have faced persecution and given their lives for their faith. Are the ones who were delivered of greater faith than the ones who died and suffered for their faith? No. Why did God deliver one and didn't deliver the other? I don't know. That isn't our lot to determine. But the fact of the matter is those who stayed faithful even in the face of absolute suffering and death will receive even the greater reward because they remain faithful to the end. We have to understand as believers that suffering persecution is part of the Christian faith because we live in a fallen world. Now, in the Western church, the modern church, we don't like to even talk about persecution. 
This month again, the first Sunday of the month when we had our brother from Brother Ron Langert from Ukraine was sharing his testimony of growing up under communism and suffering under fascism and all the suffering they went through because of wicked people. Um, that was the day, International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. And again, we're talking about persecution because, as we've said before, the month of November, we like to remind ourselves and be reminded and remind you of the persecuted church around the world. The believers are suffering persecution. Now, again, we have suffered very little persecution, in many cases, no persecution in America for our faith. Now, we do see the tides of that beginning to turn. We see that people are losing their jobs because they will put on, uh, maybe say something at their work about Christ and be fired, or maybe people will put down an application, and we know of Christians right now that are not stating that they're Christians on their applications to jobs because they know that will cost them employment. So we see the tides that this country is becoming more and more hostile to the Christian faith especially those of us who hold to the fact that Scripture is infallible, that it is our final authority, and we will not compromise our faith for the culture. That is not a popular position right now. And there are those who would gladly silence our voice and have us gagged where we could not even speak. All we have to do is look north of the border in Canada, and we will see that Canada has a hate crimes law, that you cannot speak against anything in Canada. If you critique another religion, if you stand up and say, well, I disagree with this particular lifestyle, that's considered hate speech. And as such, you can be arrested, you can be imprisoned, you can be fined, and it's happening to our brothers and sisters all over Canada and has been happening for some years. And the Canadian believers in the churches in Canada have been warning the United States, saying this is coming to your country as well. And it has come to America. And we know that we have the, fr the freedom of religion and we have the freedom of free speech, but we can see clearly in the last year, especially in the last few years, how that freedom has been under assault for some time. We see the kids in public high schools, public elementary schools, we see kids in colleges constantly having to defend their faith, being expelled, being barred and banned from college activities. Number of college campuses in the hundreds, literally, where lawsuits have been had to come before courts because people's freedom of religion, and specifically their freedom as Christians to exercise their religion, has been barred and banned and under assault on campuses. So we know that there's a growing hostility toward our faith. To what degree is persecution going to come to the shores of America? We are not really sure. It depends on which way the political winds blow. Again, I said in the last few weeks, I said politics are very important because politics and elections have consequences. The wrong people in power can cost us our freedom and freedom of speech and freedom of religion. Our Constitution is in a very precarious place right now. Again, just look at what's going on in Australia right now. Look at what's going on in New Zealand. Look at what's going on in Austria. It's fascism. Fascism is again raising its ugly head. Look at what's going on in America. This is fascism. We have people in America today that are basically no different than the brown shirts of Nazi Germany. That'll strong arm people into submission Pastor Harlow had mentioned about the recent ruling of Kyle Rittenhouse and the fact that people, uh, there, is a, there is an attitude among far leftists today that if you either, you do not acquiesce to their worldview, we will bulldoze you into the ground. We will destroy your reputation, we will destroy your livelihood, and we will destroy you if you do not acquiesce. That's nothing more than fascism, which is of the spirit of Antichrist. So persecution is something we as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ have to realize that this is something we need to start embracing and not running from. One of the reasons the Muslim community and Islam has grown so uh, rapidly in the world is because Muslims embrace the spirit of death. Now, I'm not saying all Muslims, but you have three groups of Muslims in the world. You have, you have basically 
uh, what we would commonly refer to in many Western societies as moderate Muslims. Many American Muslims today would be called liberal or moderate Muslims. They're much like liberal Christians. They don't really practice the Quran just like many Christians in America don't practice the Bible. They don't really look at the Quran as the authentic word of Allah, just like many professing Christians in America don't look at the word of God as the authentic word of God. They look at it as like, yeah, it's a good moral book, but Jesus didn't rise from the dead, and it's not supernatural. And so they're pretty much liberal. You know, they might go to mosque once in a while, like some Christians will go to church once in a while. But as far as it affecting their everyday life, it doesn't really have a great great impact upon them. And that's where a lot of Muslims in America are at. Then we have what we would commonly call definite moderate Muslims, just like we have moderate Christians in America, that they believe the Bible, they believe it to be the inspired word of God, they believe it to be true, just like many of these Muslims, same Muslims would say, well, we believe the Quran to be the word of God, we believe Muhammad to be the prophet of God, just like many moderate Christians would say, Jesus is the way to heaven. And, uh, but these aren't radicalized Muslims. These are not Muslims that are going to take the entire word of God and go out and chop your head off. You know, that they're not radicalized. Even though most of the modern Muslims believe, when we hear people say, like, well, 99% of Muslims are peaceful, <laughs> that's really not true. Because if you look at what most moderate Muslims really believe, they do believe that homosexuals should probably be stoned. They do believe in certain things that we would, in Western civilization today, would go, no, that's, that's not right. Um, so, but then you have what we call fundamentalist Muslims or radicalized Muslims. And these are Muslims that take the Quran literally, they believe the Quran is the word of Allah, and they are to follow it through. And if you follow the Quran in that context, the Quran talks about killing infidels, killing those who do not submit to the book. And that means Christians and Jews. And these are the dangerous Muslims. These are the Muslims that are lighting Christians on fire. These are the Muslims that are throwing battery acid in people's faces. These are the Muslims who are killing their children who commit apostasy by becoming Christian. These are the Muslims that would stick a knife in your chest if you insult the prophet Muhammad. And these are dangerous Muslims. And uh, there are a lot of these folks around the world. The national media, the world media wants to tell us that this is just a small, small, small fraction of Muslims, but the truth is we're talking about uh, quite a few billion Muslims in that category. And so this group of Muslims especially embrace a spirit of death because they have no assurance of salvation because the Quran does not give you assurance of salvation. One of the major differences between Christianity and Islam is that in Christianity we have assurance of salvation. We have assurance that Jesus Christ paid for our sins and was the substitutionary death substitutionary sacrifice for our sins. And as such, we can rely on the sacrifice of Christ to take away our sins. Muslims have no assurance of salvation. There is no such thing as assurance of salvation in Islam because Islam is a religion of works. And even if you work to the greatest degree that you have and you're extremely devoted to, to Allah under Islam, you still have no assurance of salvation. And because of that belief in no assurance of salvation, this is what will motivate many Muslims to uh, strap a bomb to their chest and blow themselves to kingdom come in the name of Allah because they believe if they die in jihad, eternal life in the kingdom of Allah will be their destiny. And so when you embrace a, a religion and a faith of death, it's very difficult to battle that because that is a point of you have basically, as the Apostle Paul said, I am dead to this world. And so the sad commentary is we have radicalized Muslims who are willing to strap a bomb to themselves and kill themselves or kill others for the sake of jihad and Allah, but we as believers do not have a convicting faith to live for the God that gave us life. So that's a very difficult thing to combat. And one of the reasons the Western church has had a difficulty keeping up, especially with Muslims and Islam in the West, because Islam is outgrowing Christianity in the West dramatically, 
And you may wonder, why would, why would Islam be outgrowing Christianity when we have a God who is a God of love and a God who you know, gives people assurance of salvation? I'll tell you why, because Muslims are very passionate and radical about their faith. They're not ashamed of their faith. And they have embraced a real dogmatic form of, of, of Islam that motivates them, whereas Christians have not been willing, we in the West have not been willing to embrace the aspect of persecution. We're afraid if somebody speaks evil of us. We're afraid if somebody doesn't like us. We're afraid if we speak something to somebody and we offend somebody. The Bible says the fear of man brings a snare. And so fear is a great weapon that the enemy uses against believers to shut our mouths. And of course, intimidation. Well, you better keep your mouth shut or you're going to lose your job. You better keep your mouth shut or you're going to lose your friends. You better keep your mouth shut or this person will cut you off. When in reality, what we should really be doing is making sure our mouth isn't shut, except at the appropriate time. Amen? But we should never be intimidated. And the reason we're intimidated often is because we haven't really been willing to embrace persecution. And this is why I'm preaching about persecution. And I'm not standing here as a believer saying, yeah, I've got this all down. So I'm just telling you, get with the program. There are many times in my own life that I've been cowardly and not opened my mouth when I needed to open my mouth. And I think we could, most of us, testify of that. And we have missed great opportunity for God to show up and do something wonderful in somebody else's life and in our own lives by not being willing to speak. Praise be to God. And we need, need to be bold. This is one thing I appreciate about my son Christopher. He's very bold at preaching the gospel, at his work and stuff. And I appreciate that. And we need that as believers. We need to be bold. We need to be willing to speak. The Bible says the cross of Christ is, a, is an offense to the unbeliever. Because it's the light of the gospel. It's the light of Christ. But it is the hope of Christ to those who believe. Amen? And so when we refer to persecution, we have to realize that persecution is really part of Christianity. It should be part of Christianity. But because Christianity in the West has, for the most part, been so ingrained in our culture and been part of the ethos of Western civilization since the foundation of Western civilization, because it's somewhat been kind of the state-sanctioned uh, faith of Western civilization up until recent years, really until about the 60s, it's not right now. But it had been the sanction, basically, most, Christian, most people in America looked at America from a Christian perspective. When people came to America, even today, when people come to America, they still look at America as this is a Christian nation. They come here and they're shocked. But if you talk to most people from other countries, they will think America is a Christian nation. And we used to portray ourselves as a Christian nation for the most part. But of course, we know that because of secularism and the degrading of, of spiritual truth and the weakening of the Church of America and, uh, and public education and a whole myriad of different aspects, that is not the case where Christianity is no longer the driving ethos of American culture today. It's, for the most part, pagan secularism. We're a postmodern Christian, we're a postmodern country, post-Christian post country. Even though there are many, many Christians, there's somewhere in the vicinity of about 60 to 80 percent of Americans who profess to be Christians. That's pure nonsense. There is no way there's 60 to 80 percent of Americans that are Christian. There's just no way. If they are, they're the poorest excuse of Christians I've ever seen in my life with what's going on in America and what's been going on. We have no idea really how many true Christians are in America anymore. Because even in evangelical circles, even that are professing to believe the Bible, they have compromised the integrity of the Word of God. But we don't want to get too far off on that this morning. But mainly what I wanted to talk about is persecution. Jesus often spoke of persecution. We looked at a scripture if the world hates you, know that it hate, hated me first and it's going to hate you. In Exodus chapter 1, verse 8 through 11, it says, Then a new king came to the throne of Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph or what he had done. He told his people, The Israelites are becoming a threat to us because there are so many of them. We may find a way to put an end to this if we don't, and if war breaks out, they will join with our enemies and fight against us. Then they will escape from the country. 
So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves and put brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down under heavy burdens. So we see that the people of God, when they came down to Egypt, they were people of freedom and liberty, and I preached about this quite a bit. I think there's a lot of parallelisms between what happened to the people of God in Egypt as compared to what's happening in America today. The people of God, when they came into Egypt, they were separated from the culture of the Egyptians. They were separated from the paganism of the Egyptians. The people of God, the Jewish people, lived in Goshen, separate from the culture. But by the time the new pharaoh, this other pharaoh, came in later on, after Joseph had died, by the time this pharaoh came out, it says the whole land was full of the Israelites. What happened? They became assimilated into the culture. They became paganized by the culture, and they began to be oppressed by the culture because they had abandoned their their confidence or abandoned their covenant with God. And so by the Spirit of God, they began to cry out under their agony. They began to cry out under the burden of their taskmasters, and God began to hear their cries and raised up, of course, Moses And Moses, by the power of the Holy Spirit, power of God, came in and delivered the children of Israel out of bondage. But the the nation of Israel was birthed and came into existence from a nation of slaves under bondage. They came out of Egypt with Jacob. They came out of Egypt, the seed of Jacob, and out of that seed, God made the nation of Israel. He literally formed a nation that he birthed out of bondage and created a nation, much like the United States of America. Again, parallelisms between the United States and Egypt. As a matter of fact, I think it was Benjamin Franklin wanted the national seal to be the children of Israel being coming through the Red Sea or coming through the Red Sea uh, in freedom. I think that was what Benjamin Franklin wanted. He wanted a parallelism between the children of Israel escaping Egypt from the Red Sea relating to the United States it's being birthed out of bondage as well from Great Britain. So there are some parallelisms, many parallelisms between the United States and in, in Israel. But God birthed this nation of Israel as a nation out of bondage. Glory to God. He created this nation of slaves into great men and women of God because God is a great God. But they came out of bondage. And so the story of God's people is a story of people from bondage to freedom by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the power of God. Amen? We see later on in Israel's life, in Israel's, the nation of Israel, what happened? Well, God told them, if you obey my commandments and you will hearken to the voice of my word, then these blessings will come upon you. You'll overcome. You'll be the head and not the tail. You'll be above and not believe beneath. Uh, you'll go out against your enemies and they'll flee from you. You'll lend to many and not borrow. But he goes on in Deuteronomy, if you disobey these words of my commandment and you continue and you do like the nations around you that I'm driving out before you, what will happen? Well, you'll go out against your enemies and you'll flee from them. You'll become the borrower instead of the lender. All of these curses will come upon you that I put upon the nations if you disobey me well we know the story the story of Israel the story of the people of God the story of the nation of Israel is one of a lot of God doing victorious things and obedience but also a story of rebellion and sin and darkness much like like our nation amen a lot of same parallels and because of Israel's sin and darkness and because of wickedness uh, there were leaders in the land who did wicked things We know that the northern kingdom, when the kingdoms were split between the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel, what happens? Eventually, the northern kingdom falls into complete gross idolatry. They never have a good king. And out of the northern kingdom, they fall into Baal worship. And and Jezebel, the wife of Ahab, begins to persecute the people of God. She literally hunts down the prophets of God and kills them, executes them. And Obadiah, the prophet, hides a group of prophets in a, cave, in a cave and begins to feed them and take care of them. And we see the story of Elijah where he confronts the prophets of Baal and uh, challenges them to, to uh, a duel, so to speak, the God of heaven versus the pagan gods of the Baal worshipers. But um, we see great persecution. And even after the prophets of Baal are slaughtered, Jezebel swears, he says, the sun will not set before I see your gray head go down to the grave. And she goes after Elijah and tries to kill him. 
And he has to run for his life. So the story of the people, the true people of God in the northern kingdom is a story of persecution. And later on, in the southern kingdom, the same thing happens, where the true people of God are persecuted for their faith, and the people of God, the other people begin to commit apostasy, and they turn from God. So what happens as a result of their apostasy, as a result of their sin, God allows oppression to come into the life. God begins to abandon in the people. In other words, he leaves them to their own vices. He, he begins to what we call an abandonment judgment, where God no longer goes out with their an- armies, where God no longer is pouring out his blessing. God is beginning to remove himself from the people because they are removing themselves from him by their disobedience. And as a result, what happens? Well, plagues, pestilence, famine, natural disasters, but also enemies come in and oppress the people of God. And this is the story of the people of God throughout their history. Because of their disobedience, they often fall under great persecution. And in their persecution, what do they do? They begin to cry out to God in their persecution. They begin to cry out to God in their distress. And God is merciful, and God hears their cries, and God restores them or delivers them. And that's the story of Israel from the beginning of the nation until really today even. Manasseh, the evil king of Judah, destroyed the innocents because he was a Baal worshiper as well. It says, moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood till he filled Jerusalem from one end to another beside his sin by which he made Judah sin in doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Bloodshed, murder, treachery, idolatry, every sort of wickedness. It became so wicked in Judah, became so bad in Judah that the people literally had a, uh, uh, they literally built a house for homosexuals that was right next door to the temple of God. Sodomites. The people were, uh, were worshiping the God of heaven, uh, not the true and living God, but they were worshiping toward the east. They were worshiping the sun God. They were worshiping Baal. And uh, the Bible talks about women weeping for Tamaz, who is the goddess of sun god worship, offshoot of Baal worship, and so on. So both the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah fell into apostasy. Now, if you read the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet, right? Jeremiah was only probably about 17 years old when God called him to be a prophet, And God sent Jeremiah with a message to the nation. And if you read the book of Jeremiah, you could really say that the book of Jeremiah could easily be a contemporary book to the people of the land today. Because Jeremiah is calling for repentance, and he's warning the people, and he's warning the nation, and he's saying, if you do not repent, if you do not turn from your sin, I am going to raise up the Babylonians, and they will come in and they will destroy you. And he speaks this to the king, and he's persecuted. He's considered a traitor. He's considered a traitor because they look at him as colluding with their enemy, the Babylonians, but he's warning them. And as a result of his prophecy, in Jeremiah 20, verses 1 and 2, he's whipped. In Jeremiah 26, 8 through 9, he's mobbed and nearly killed. In Jeremiah 32, 2, he was imprisoned. In Jeremiah 37, 15, he was flogged. In Jeremiah 37, 15, he's again imprisoned. In Jeremiah 38, verse 6, he was placed in a muddied cistern pit with mud up to his waist. And in Jeremiah 38, verse 28, he was placed in the courtyard prison until the capture of Jerusalem. Jeremiah suffered for his obedience to God. As a matter of fact, there's a point in Jeremiah's life where he doesn't want to speak the word of God anymore. He's suffering so much, he said, I will not say anything anymore. You know, and that's what the enemy wants. The enemy wants to put pressure on you. He wants to put pressure on us where we keep our mouths shut. In other words, it's always this, keep your mouth shut or you're going to get hurt. Stay out of our business or you're going to get hurt. Because the devil's a bully. 
And that's what he's saying to the church. Keep your Christianity in your church. Don't bring it out into the public square. And don't be preaching your Bible out in places that really matter. Just be a Christian. Come here and do this, but don't bring it out into our public squares. Don't bring it into the education system. Don't bring it into our government. Don't bring it into any place that impacts the culture or where we don't want to hear it. Don't bring it there or you're going to get hurt. And Jeremiah was being hurt for his faith in God and his obedience to God. And finally... He just wouldn't say anything, and he's listening to these false prophets. He's listening to the modern Pied Pipers of his day, and they're saying all types of things. Oh, yes, we're going to overcome the king of Babylon. Yes, you're going to conquer, you're going to conquer. And it says, it was like a fire shut up in my bones. And he said, finally, I spoke. We pray that the word of God is like a fire shut up in our bones that woe be unto me if I speak not. Jeremiah was a man of passion. Finally, he had to speak the word of God. Amen. This brings us up to one of the most outstanding couple of stories in the book of Daniel about persecution. And, of course, we don't have time to read it. I have it written down here in my notes. You have the reference in your notes. And basically, the entire chapter 3 of Daniel. Daniel, one of the most supernatural books in the entire Hebrew Scripture. But we know the story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego... When, when Nebuchadnezzar invaded Jerusalem, as was prophesied by, by Jeremiah the prophet, in his first invasion of Jerusalem, he invades Jerusalem three times, and the third time he completely destroys the temple and tears down the walls, carries the, the riches of the temple off, and uh, the people left in Jerusalem are, are basically destitute. But the first time he invades the kingdom, he carries away all the nobility's offspring. And with that, he carries away Daniel. He carries away Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He carries away the nobility's family. And of course, these young men were made eunuchs. And they were appointed to serve in the courts of the king. And so they went through a vigorous training period. We know the story that Daniel and his companion, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were found to be head and shoulders above the wise men of the land of Egypt, so, of, of Babylon. And so we also know the story that Nebuchadnezzar has this, this dream and he can't interpret it and the wise men can't interpret it, but God gives Daniel supernatural wisdom and Daniel interprets it, shows him that King Nebuchadnezzar is this great head of gold because Nebuchadnezzar sees this great statue, a head of gold and a chest of silver and a waist of, of uh, bronze and legs of iron and ten toes, some iron and some clay. And Daniel, by the Spirit of God, interprets this dream. So Nebuchadnezzar promotes Daniel to an incredible high position, which shows us something. And let's go back a little bit because one of the people we didn't talk about is Joseph. Remember Joseph? Joseph is betrayed by his brothers. He's sold into slavery. He becomes a servant in Potiphar's house. But even in captivity, God blesses Joseph. And then Joseph's betrayed again, and he ends up in the courts of Pharaoh. He ends up in the prison of Pharaoh. And even there, God gives him supernatural favor. And even there, God takes Joseph from the, from the prison and sets him up into the palace seemingly overnight. So the point I'm making, even in great persecution and even in great distress, God is well able to deliver us. God is well able to turn our captivity into triumph. God is well able to turn any situation around. So I'm assuring you, even though a lot of the things I've been saying are very sobering, very, at times, troubling, and at times, maybe, maybe some man, Pastor Tim, I just don't have any hope. I want to assure you, God can turn things around instantly. But the key to it is repentance. So the, great, the degree of suffering we as a nation are going to go through and the degree of abandonment by God as a nation, and I'm not talking about individuals, but the degree of abandonment we suffer as a nation is going to be dependent upon the degree that we are will, unwilling to humble ourselves and repent. That is always the story throughout history. God gives grace to the humble, but what does he do? He resists the proud. And if America continues to be stiff-necked and proud, we will go the way of Israel. We will suffer trouble. And we deserve to. But if we will humble ourselves and we will cry out to God and we will repent, God can heal this land. Amen? He's healed Israel. He's healed the nation of Israel on a number of occasions. So Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, going back to Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, 
Daniel is promoted, and Daniel prom- says to the king, how about my friends, these other companions, at Sh- uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? And they're, the Abednego, they're promoted. And what happens? Well, Nebuchadnezzar is a typical pagan king. He's filled with pride. And Nebuchadnezzar, if you read the book of, if you read Daniel's, Daniel, the prophecy of Daniel, if you read Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he is such a hothead. He has a temper problem. And you see it in the first part of the book of Daniel when you deal with Nebuchadnezzar. This man is, is crazy mad. If you know somebody with a hot head, you've never seen anything like Nebuchadnezzar. He would do crazy stuff. So what happens? He gets this idea, I'm the head of gold. So he builds a statue 90 feet tall and he makes a decree. This is, this is the crazy thing about Nebuchadnezzar. Think of the crazy decrees these kings would make. There was obviously a spirit over that region. There was a spirit of death and darkness. These kings were ruthless. They didn't care about human rights. They killed people at the whim. And they had every right to do it because they were such, they had all power. So Nebuchadnezzar makes this statue. He doesn't just say, hey, you know what? When the, when the trumpet blows, when the band plays, bow down and worship the statue. No, he says, you bow down and worship the statue or I'm going to throw you into a fire and cook your gizzard. I'm going to heat up a furnace. If you don't bow down, you're going to burn. Now, can you imagine if, the, if, a, if the, the devil, that's how the devil operates though, isn't he? He puts fear into people. Yeah, you better bow down. You better bow down or you're going to burn. But he puts out this decree, and he says, if you won't bow, you'll burn. Some people have asked me before, why did God put that? Why was that tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden to begin with? There's some to debate, maybe God didn't put it there in the first place. But from reading the Bible, it seems every indication God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden. Remember, it's not called the tree of evil. It's tr- called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why did he put it there? Well, what is love if it has no test? Is it love? How would you like to serve a God that says, you will serve me. You have no choice. I mean, I'm sure the people just bowed down like crazy when Nebuchadnezzar, the trumpets blowed and the sound went off because I'm going to end up in a fiery furnace if I don't bow down, right? Well, did they really love Nebuchadnezzar? Did they think, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, you're an awesome king. Yes, so I'll bow before you. No, they were coerced into it. God wants us to serve him because we want to serve him. Love has to have a test. If you love your wife, you love your husband, there has to be a test. You prove your love for them by your obedience, your, your fellowship with them, your commitment to them. That's the proof of your love. And our commitment to Christ is obedience to his commandments. Amen? So what's the story? The story is the trumpet blows. Three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they stand out there. They will not bow. And then a report comes back to the king, and the king blows a gasket. He, it says he flew into a rage. What? brings these guys in, summoned before this king, and the king says, I hear you won't bow before the sound of the psaltery and the harp and the musical instruments. He says, I'm going to give you one more time. You bow or we're going to burn you in that furnace. And I love Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're typical rebellious teenagers, and they are teenagers. They're flippant. You know how teenagers are sometimes, like, Oh, king, we're not, we're not even going to hesitate to answer you in this matter. We're not going to bow. We're not going to burn. And if we burn, our God is able to deliver us. But if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow before you. <laughs> and and I, I'd like to see someday when we go to the kingdom of God, I want to see this played out, what Nebuchadnezzar really looked like. I can imagine he just blew a gasket, just flew into a rage, probably picked stuff up and thrown it across the room. And he says, I command that the furnace be heated seven times hotter. This is how crazy bad people with bad tempers are where they do stupid things. Nebuchadnezzar did a lot of really stupid things when he was blowing a gasket. He commands the best people of his kingdom. He commands the leaders of his, his troops, his top generals. to. Th- he doesn't just pick some peon down here that just enlisted. No, he takes the best commanders, the best warriors, and he commands them to throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire. And what happens to them when they do? It kills them. I wonder how that set with his army. Probably not very well. The other thing, think of the stupidity of Nebuchadnezzar initially. 
Remember when Daniel was called before the king to interpret the dream? So here's the king. (laughs) It's kind of like the stupidity of Joe Biden. Uh, I hate to say it, but we have a health epidemic, so let's get rid of our nurses. We have crime waves, so let's get rid of our police force. We have inflation, so let's spend more money. So this is what Nebuchadnezzar does. I can't get my dream interpreted, and I'm ticked off, so I'm going to kill every smart person in my entire kingdom. Good idea. Kill all the brilliant people. Kind of like what happened in the French Revolution where they killed all the, the biblical, godly people, they killed all the intelligent people, wiped them out, and all they had left were the stupid people, the uneducated people, literally. And France never recovered from it. Truly, they never recovered. The Huguenots left France, they went over to Great Britain, and Great Britain became the greatest country in the history of the world at that time because the smart people left. That's what happens when stupid people lead countries. And so Nebuchadnezzar flies into this rage. He's going to kill all the smart people. Thank God God had mercy upon Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego, and uh, gave them an interpretation. So what happens? We know the story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they get thrown into the fiery furnace. God comes into the furnace, delivers them. Nebuchadnezzar falls on his face. And you know, Nebuchadnezzar, it takes him a long time to learn. Nebuchadnezzar, he brings him out and said, your God is truly the God. And he said, this is the decree I make. Anybody who will not worship the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I'm going to hack them to pieces. <laughs> Later on, Not real lot later on, Nebuchadnezzar gets called on the carpet. Daniel comes in, and God gives Nebuchadnezzar another dream. And he says, oh, king, live forever. I wish this was for your enemies. He said, God is going to cause you to lose your mind, and you will be led out into the garden like a wild beast and grow long fingernails and hair long until you recognize that the God of all gods rules over the kingdoms of the earth. God humbles Nebuchadnezzar, And he loses his mind, and he eats hay and grass for somewhere along the line of seven years. They restore his kingdom. He comes back to his senses, and from that day forward, we never see Nebuchadnezzar again flying into some crazy rage and doing stupid things. He says, truly there is a God in heaven, and he rules over the kings of the earth. And Nebuchadnezzar literally became a follower of Yahweh. So this brings us to some of the New Testament. We talked about Nebuchadnezzar and what went on. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they fought the good fight of faith, and they stood firm in the middle of a hostile culture, much like we are facing today, and many of our brothers and sisters in other countries are facing, where we have to stand up against the tyranny of the hour. We have to stand up against the culture. We have to stand firm in our faith. And let's share a little bit here this morning about... Of course, uh, the apostles. We know that seven of the twelve apostles of the Lamb, seven of Jesus' uh, disciples that he chose while on earth, of his original disciples, uh, were actually martyred for their faith in Christ. Peter, tradition has it that Peter was literally crucified upside down for his faith in Christ. James, the son of Debedee, uh, was put to death by Herod Agrippa shortly before the day of Pentecost. Andrew uh, is reported to have been crucified at Patria in Achaia. Matthew, uh, there is a legend that he died as a martyr in Ethiopia. Thomas was martyred in Persia or India and is said to have been uh, run through by a lance. And James, according to tradition, James, the son of Alphaeus, was thrown down from the temple by scribes and Pharisees, and he was then stoned uh, and uh, in a gruesome way. Jude, according to tradition, Jude taught in Armenia, Syria, and Persia where he was martyred. Uh, tradition tells us that he was buried in Kara Kalisa, and where he, which is now a modern-day Ram. And John, the Apostle John, who wrote the Gospel of John and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and is credited with the book of Revelation. Of course, tradition has it that under uh, Diocletian, that he was boiled in oil but wouldn't die, and then as a result, he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos where he recorded the letter of Revelation. And so seven of the 12 apostles, as far as we know, were murdered for their faith in Christ. So persecution 
was a trademark of the early church. It has been a characteristic of the body of Christ and Christians throughout the ages, and it most definitely is parcel and post with Christianity today all over the world. When we think of countries like northern India, where Christians are very severely persecuted by not only Muslims, but also radical um, Hindus. When we think of countries like Iran and Iraq and, and uh, different countries around the world, uh, uh, Nigeria, where somewhere in the vicinity of 350 to 400,000 Christians have been martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. Persecution is a very, very real factor to Christians all over the world. And again, we in the West, while we face very little persecution, we see that persecution is on the rise because tyranny in the West is on the rise, especially when we consider what's going on in Australia right now, where Australia has basically come under complete tyrannical government. Uh, I think what we're seeing happening in some of these countries is very similar to pre-World War II Nazi Germany, which is very disturbing. And, of course, this is going to come upon Christians as well. Uh, according to the International Christian Concern, uh, these, these accounts are somewhat dated, uh, but uh, I just wanted to bring you up to date on some of these because they're very, very uh, apropos to what we're speaking about. Persecution of Christians today. There are more attacks on Christians in the last century than in all previous centuries combined. That means that... There are Christians being persecuted, uh, and again, Prager University put out a very excellent video uh, called The Most Persecuted People Group in the World, and that is, of course, Christians. And so there are more Christians being persecuted for the faith today. Some estimate that about 325 to 350,000 Christians every day are suffering either mild or severe persecution, and we're talking about everything from losing your job, uh, not being able to get a job, to being raped, murdered, um, and every sort of brutality under the sun that's happening all over the world. Today, 200 million um, Christians are imprisoned, starved, or murdered for their faith. And of course, again, I said this was data because today that's up to 325 to 350. And of course, this is taking place in over 50 countries of the world. There are over 50 countries of the world right now where it is illegal to be a Christian. And in many of those countries, it carries with it the death penalty for converting to Christianity. So we know that persecution is definitely going on all over the world today. And so we need to awaken the world, awaken the body of Christ, and uh, bring attention to this because the Western media pretty much ignores it. Uh, again, if this was any other group of people other than Christians in the West, we, it would be an outrage. It would be outrageous, and it would be carried all over the modern-day media. But because it is Christians, uh, and, and I'm not, not saying this apologetically, because it is Christians, the Western media ignores it because it just shows the contempt that Western media has for Christianity because they despise it because most of our Western media of course, has been infiltrated by leftist ideology, which is essentially communist ideology. But we know that the church in the West is not going to escape persecution. Again, Jesus talked about uh, the time leading up and into the Great Tribulation, which we're living next door to. And in the Great Olivet Discourse, Jesus says uh, about what would happen to his followers. He says in verse 19 of or verse 9 through 14 of chapter 24 of the Gospel of Matthew, he says, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Well, that's happening, isn't it? And then many will be offended. They will betray one another and will hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and deceive many, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Here again is that admonition by Jesus to endure to the end. We see this throughout Scripture. He who endures to the end. He who stays steadfast. He who uh, does not deny the faith. He who is, uh, stands even unto death, loving their lives, not even unto death. 
But because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, but he who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. So Jesus was saying here that you're going to be delivered up, people are going to hate you, they're going to persecute you, they're going to say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake, but rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for your reward will be great. Amen. Uh, Revelation chapter 13, we took, looked at this scripture last week about the mark of the beast, the great world, uh, or the new world order, the great reset, economic reset, and uh, what I said is I believe we're possibly seeing the emergence of the antichrist globalist end time beast system in our very hour. And in the book of Revelation chapter 13, it says in verse 14, speaking about the Antichrist, speaking about this system of the beast, and it says, He deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which was granted to, he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give a breath to the image of the beast, and the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many who would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So again, going back to what we said last week, if you go back to my message last week, um, under the early church in the Roman Empire, they had what was called emperor worship. And if you, in order to show your allegiance to Rome and to the emperor, uh, you would have to burn a pinch of incense. They called this burning a pinch of incense, incense to Caesar. And so you would have to pay allegiance by bowing down and burning incense, worshiping Caesar, whichever Caesar, whichever leader it was who claimed themselves to be God. And if you refused to do so, it could carry with it a loss of income, a loss of job. It could, you could be arrested. You could be murdered. And many Christians gave their lives in the arena, in prison, and so on and so forth, and in slavery because they refused to burn a pinch of incense to Caesar. So in the early church, in the first century church, this was the mark of the beast. But as I said before, every generation could face a type of the Antichrist and a system of the mark of the beast. Under Adolf Hitler, it was paying allegiance to Hitler and Nazi Germany and to this tyrannical leadership. Under Soviet communism, it was paying allegiance to communism. And it is today in the Chinese political communistic party. It's allegiance to, to the, the leadership, allegiance to the communist party. And, of course, if you don't, uh, you're sent to possibly sent to a re-education camp, so to speak, concentration camp, an indoctrination camp. You could be tortured. You could be imprisoned. You could be murdered. And this is happening all over the world. But ultimately, this will be the true, the ultimate fulfillment of the Antichrist. And this man will wage war against the saints, and those who will not worship the beast and the image of the beast will be killed. And so this is the story of Christianity from its inception because we are living in a world that's fallen. We're living in a world that's controlled by the spirit of darkness, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. And because of this, uh, we are going to face persecution. And this is why our brothers and sisters are dying for their faith, being persecuted for our faith. And, of course, bringing this to the United States this all boils down to the same thing. We are eventually going to be faced between the battle between righteousness and unrighteousness, light versus darkness, truth versus lies, and we're seeing this play out in our society right now before our eyes. Let me share, a, in conclusion today, I want to share a, a message regarding persecution, and this is Lord Carey of uh, Britain, who served as the Archbishop of, the Canterbury, of Canterbury from 1991 to 2002. And he has long voiced his, uh, raised his voice in, in a situation claiming that we are in a very precarious position in the West, and that we are on the verge of some great, great persecution in the West Church. Of course, again, look to the North, look to Canada, What's going on in Canada right now where churches are being closed, pastors are being arrested to speak against anyone of another faith or to even critique another faith or critique, critique, uh, uh, 
to criticize the LGBTQ uh, movement is going to carry with it a, a severe fine or possibly imprisonment even. And he says the average Christian in uh, congregations over here or in the UK don't know enough about it, persecution, and are very often so focused on their own concerns, he stated, as he read, as readily points out, that the 20th century has become, there have become more martyrs than any century before it. But most people don't even know this, and this is one of the reasons I'm raising my voice about this. Kerry summarized the problem. They want to silence Christianity. They want to marginalize us. They want to silence us, and they want to intimidate us. And he goes on to warn Christians. Now listen to this. This is what I want to get to. Don't lie down. If you behave like a doormat, don't be surprised if they treat you like a doormat. We got, we've got to rise up and actually be content, confident in our preaching and teaching to have a view on things. In other words, we have to have a backbone. We have to stand firm. We have to not compromise our faith and bow down to the pressures of the culture. And, of course, this has been one of my contentions in the Western church, in the church in America, that there are too many pulpits in the American church that are afraid to speak truth to darkness, afraid to proclaim the righteousness of Christ because it's not popular and it's not going to win you points and people are not going to like you for it. So he says we need to take, a, take to the streets if necessary. In other words, nonviolent protest is a proper Christian way to behave. Now, again, think of Mahatma Gandhi who literally led um, India in a transforming and liberating the nation through, through nonviolent protests. Uh, I think of the civil rights movement in America, Martin Luther King Jr., who literally brought about enough pressure because of nonviolent protests against uh, racism in America and Jim Crow laws in the South and, 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 and discrimination that the Civil Rights Act was signed pressuring uh, Congress and pressuring this nation to change. And praise be to God, they did. I think some of that's going to have to take place in this hour. I think, again, of our brothers and sisters in other countries, in Australia, that are being severely persecuted for their faith and basically under tyrannical government, and yet we in America, we pretty much stand by like sheep. Uh, they take away our rights, we do nothing. They close our churches, we do nothing. Uh, they you know, say you can't preach the gospel in schools, we do nothing. You, they say you can't pray here, we do nothing. What's it going to take to wake us up to the fact that we are willing to stand up for our faith? Again, I, I contend if this were Muslims, if, if we were seeing this kind of shutting down of mosques and so on in the Muslim community, there would be a great outrage, great outcry. And yet in the Christian community, we just go along with it as if we are supposed to obey the government and everything the government says, like dumb sheep led to the slaughter. Um, and this is what he's saying. We can't do this. And he said the battle for the heart of religious freedom will continue to be fought in television, book, politics, not least of all in the courtroom. And um, so he talks about this. He says that the first thing they're going to do is marginalize you. And once they marginalize you, put you to the side, then they're going to discriminate against you, and once they discriminate against you, the next process will be they, they will persecute you. So first they marginalize you, you're of no significance, then they, <coughs> excuse me, then they uh, discriminate against you, and finally the last step will they will persecute you. Well, we're going to wrap it up here today, and I'm just urging you to consider what's going on in our nation and consider what's going on in the world. First and foremost, pray for our brothers and sisters. <coughs> Excuse me. Pray for our brothers and sisters in other countries. The persecuted church around the world, the number one thing they ask of the church in the West is that we would pray for them. So we must remember them in our prayers, lift them up before the throne, speak about persecution. There's many resources on the Internet right now, Voice of the Martyrs, International Christian Concern, Open Doors International, a lot of other ministries. There's a myriad of resources out there that can give you information about persecution. Again, I'd urge you to go watch the Prager University video, the most persecuted people group on the planet. Um, very informative. So become educated. Get involved with some of these ministries and find out what's really going on 
with persecution in the world. So pray for our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted. Lift them up before the throne. Pray for them. Pray for their captors. Pray for resources and deliverance. Um, get involved with, with uh, being educated and educating other believers and other people about the plight of Christians around the world. Speak up for the defenseless. Um, the Bible talks about in Hebrews that remember those who are in chains as though chained with them. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about when Jesus said, I was in prison and you visited me. Uh, you can write letters to prisoners. Uh, you can pray for them and so on and so forth. Uh, and also financial support, if you can, for, su support people. We, this month, of course, Living Faith Church, our special mission focus this month is, is uh, the persecuted church. So if you'd like to give a special offering, those of you watching over the inter Internet, you can go to our offering link and say, I'd like to support this offering for the persecuted church. You can put it in there, and that money, all the offerings will go to the persecuted church this month. So praise be to God. So pray, be informed. Uh, wake people up and support them uh, any way you can. And so, and of course, in our own country, stand up for the truth. Stop being cowardly. Stand up for what's righteous. Stand up for what's true. We are living in an age where there are voices trying to silence us, trying to pressure us to not speak up for what is right. And we cannot afford to be quiet. We cannot afford to be like sheep that are led to the slaughter. We must stand steadfast on numerous fronts and fight the good fight of faith. You know, we love people and we love even our enemies, but this does not mean that we are silent in the face of opposition. This does not mean that we simply cower because it will cost us something. Uh, we need to resist darkness. We need to resist the, the lies of the enemy, and we need to resist the temptation to f fear man and fear the intimidation of the devil. Well, let's go ahead and pray because the most important thing is you know Jesus Christ. And if you're not right with Jesus Christ, you need to make sure you're right with Jesus Christ. Well, what good does it do to gain the whole world and yourself be lost or cast away? So I want to pray with you today. And if you never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, giving him full control of your life, today is the day. This is not the hour to be half in and half out of the kingdom. This is not the hour to be riding this, the fence. This is not the hour to be lukewarm. Jesus said, if you are lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. This is the hour to be right with God. So if you want to get right with God today, I'm going to pray with you. And this simply means I'm making a commitment to Jesus Christ. Now you can say this prayer and continue to live like the devil and continue to go about your own way and this prayer will do you no good. But if you pray this prayer with me today and you make a wholehearted commitment to follow after Jesus Christ and surrender your life to him and carry on with your faith in Christ, then your life will be transformed and you will be born again and you will be part of the kingdom of God. So this morning, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for every person listening to this message today and I pray that they will be convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray for boldness, Father, for them and strength to stand firm and steadfast in this hour and not turn away from you, that that which they commit to you, you would keep unto that day. Now, I just want you to pray this with me. Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinful person. I know that I've broken your commandments, and I ask for your mercy. I believe Jesus died for my sin, that he was raised from the dead, and is seated at the right hand of Almighty God. I declare from this day forward that Jesus Christ is my Lord, my Savior, and my Master. I renounce sin, I renounce the devil, and I renounce his kingdom. And by your power, I will live for you from this day forward in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Those of you watching on the internet, I pray you'll click the subscribe button. That way you'll get notifications when we put a new video out and hit the like button if you like this message. God bless you all and thanks for joining us today. Bye-bye.